It was such a high profile and expensive mission. They just couldn't afford to fail. Something like 10,000 people in 14 different countries have contributed to making the project happen. The breakthrough of the year is a prize where we pick the bit of science that has made the biggest impact that year. The topic we decided on for this year is the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST as we normally call it. It sees the universe in an entirely new way. They first started talking about what the next mission would be back in 1989, so that was before and Hubble even Hubble left the ground. The Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. That really solidified some years later when Hubble first created a deep field image. They found that this empty bit of sky was full of galaxies and they realized they could see much further back into the history of the universe than people had thought. So astronomers needed an infrared telescope to be able to study these galaxies and see a lot of them. Where JWST wins over Hubble is by being able to observe at much longer infrared wavelengths. Hubble is about sort of one sixth the collecting area of JWST. Hubble can't see the most distant galaxies without that infrared component. Infrared is also important for studying exoplanets. The mission like Kepler measures a bunch of colors jumbled together, like white light. JWST provides us with this new way of looking at exoplanets by studying the constituents and the properties of their atmospheres. It's looking at these dimmings of light in hundreds of colors all at once in the infrared. To do the science that they wanted to do required technologies that had never been done before in a space telescope. So the cost estimate kept going up, the launch date kept being, getting pushed back. In 2011, Congress threatened to cancel the whole project. So I think there's a fundamental question, not for me, but for the country at large, and including some of our colleagues, of why we're doing this. It was, you know, definitely threatened and on life support for a little while. Congress gave it a reprieve, but they set an absolute budget maximum and a firm deadline, and NASA had to keep to that. It sort of defies the imagination that you could get this thing into space because it looked so huge. Then there was the long process of loading it into a container and putting it on a ship and sending it to French Guiana, where it was launched on an Ariane rocket from the European Space Agency. And liftoff. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. From the moment of launch, which is on Christmas Day, it all just seemed to go perfectly. There were something around 350 possible failures where a single object could fail and it would cripple some part of the mission. The fact that so much stuff was out of my control meant that I wasn't as anxious as I, as I might have been. I did feel very nervous. I couldn't really fathom that everything would work. When you're pushing technology and you're doing something for the very first time, there's always the unexpected. As they were commissioning it up in space while it was uh, on its way to its station, they were ticking those off. And we have a fully deployed JWST observatory. They were getting more and more relaxed as time went by. Yes. It wasn't until July that we actually got a peek at the very first data. We saw the spectrum from the atmosphere of a planet called WASP-96b. And we were watching this on NASA TV, but simultaneously we were running the calculations from the simulator that we used before Webb launched. We're looking at the dots on the screen and the error bars, and we compare them to what we saw on our computers. And they matched almost exactly. That's when I knew that JWST was going to deliver on its promise, that it was going to give us precision 
It means that everything we proposed to do with the telescope in just the first year, we were going to be able to do. Right after the release of those early observations, our first exoplanet was observed. We saw the carbon dioxide, we saw carbon monoxide, and then we saw this molecule, sulfur dioxide. The first detection of a molecule in an exoplanet that also requires photochemistry. The very first image that was released was this deep field image. JWST was pointed at an empty patch of sky and left looking at it, I think, for 12 and a half hours. Now, remember that uh, Hubble deep field images took hundreds of hours. Scientists have also found some of the most distant galaxies that have ever been seen in the infrared in that first image. So it was already uh, groundbreaking when it came out. I think it's going to be incredibly exciting what we can learn about the very earliest galaxies in the universe. It's just amazing how once you start observing in the infrared how galaxies pop out. The infrared can cut through some of the interstellar dust and show you stuff that you just can't see with Hubble. The parts of JWST are all working better than we could have hoped. The original requirement for the JWST lifetime was five years with a goal of 10 years. By using less fuel during the launch and ascent part, that means there's more fuel left for the station keeping. The station keeping fuel looks like it could easily last 20 to 25 years. Knowing that the spacecraft will last for 20 years, you're talking about hundreds, maybe even over a thousand exoplanets that will have atmospheric diagnostics that will tell us a lot about how planets form and evolve. Whenever people have built a new and better instrument, they've always discovered things that they didn't even imagine. Having the sort of information they're getting now, which they've never had before, is going to bring, uh, you know, huge advances. It's just going to have such a transformative effect on astronomy.